and it's all you. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the Jewish Federation of New Hampshire. I'm thrilled that you are all participating with us tonight and I'm thrilled at our lineup that we have to speak to you. As you are probably keenly aware, anti-Semitism and racism and other uh, forms of acts of hate and extremist activity are on the rise, not just in our country and globally, but also in our little beloved state of New Hampshire. We often are asked questions about why someone who posted something despicable on social media wasn't prosecuted or why a certain act of vandalism didn't constitute a hate crime. Tonight, we'll be hearing from the experts on the law. Uh, what is the law? What is a threat? What can be prosecuted? And what other remedies are available? We are not talking about specific incidents per se, except to the extent that they shed light on the law. I'd like to take a moment and invite you all to a community conversation with JFNH and other organizations like the New Hampshire Council of Churches and the Manchester NAACP and the Cone Center on Holocaust and Genocide Studies on March 18th, when we will be hearing from Alyssa Krauss of the Anti-Defamation League on the state of white supremacy and extremism in New Hampshire. But tonight it's all about the law. Um, so I'll uh, tell you briefly about who will be speaking and I will put some more information about them in the chat uh, at the end of the program. We are very fortunate to have these speakers. First up will be Arusha Gordon and Kiera Lucas, who are both with the James Beard Junior Center to Stop Hate at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. The Beard Center works to support individuals and communities targeted for hate and to challenge white supremacy. Ms. Gordon is the Associate Director and Ms. Luca is the Project Assistant. We are also fortunate to have Sean Locke, the Director of the Civil Rights Unit of the State New Hampshire Attorney General's Office. And we have Seth Aframe, frame Assistant U.S. Attorney, Appellate Chief, and Civil Rights Coordinator for the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of New Hampshire. And he is also a periodic lecturer on First Amendment law. And last but not least, we are also fortunate to have Raphael Katz, the Affirmative Civil Enforcement Coordinator and Civil Rights Coordinator at the U.S. Attorney's Office in New Hampshire. Um, so I'm expecting this to be a really edifying session tonight. We are recording the session. I ask you to also stay muted, um, except during a brief portion. Well, no, stay muted. You can ask us questions through the chat feature. The questions will come to me except for one um, segment of the program, and then I'll direct them to the speakers. Um, during Arusha Gordon's session, the chat will be open to everyone, but please stay muted during the program. Allison, did I cover all the opening? I think you got it all. All right. So we're going to start with Arusha Gordon and Kiara Lucas. Great. Thank you so much, Dina, and to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I know there's quite a bit of Zoom events going on, um, so thanks for giving us your time. Um, so as Dina mentioned, my name is Arusha Gordon. I'm the Associate Director of the James Byrd Jr. Center to Stop Hate at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Two very long names. Um, but the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, for folks who aren't familiar with the organization, is an organization that was founded at the request of John F. Kennedy at the height of the civil rights movement with the purpose of bringing lawyers into the fight for equal justice under law. 
Um, and the James Byrd Jr. Center to Stop Hate is a recent team founded at the Lawyers Committee uh, with the express purpose of supporting communities and victims targeted for hate crimes and fighting white supremacy using litigation, community education, and other tools. Um, and Kira is my wonderful colleague who I will let uh, introduce herself as well. Hi everyone. Um, as we should say, so we're me and Arusha are colleagues. We both work on the, at the Bird Center um, for short, since our names are so long. As Arusha said, we call it the Bird Center. Um, I'm the project assistant, and so in that role, we have a national hate crimes resource and reporting hotline that I manage, and um, we collect. Uh, we have live call, a live calls function, and we also have an online submission portal that uh, folks just like yourself, anyone from across the country can submit reports to us and we'll try our best to um, assist. And if you call the hotline, you more than likely will be talking to me. So happy to be here and look forward to tonight's presentation. So I will just pull up my presentation. Uh, let's see. So can folks see my slide deck? Yes. Okay. Um, right. So let's just see. Um, so did introduction. So just quickly, and you can type your answers in the uh, chat box there. But what is a hate crime? Can folks kind of shout out some words um, or type in some words rather? And actually, I can't see what's coming in now that I'm sharing my screen. Um, so if people can kind of, Kira, maybe you can read some off if, if anyone's typing things in. Everyone should be able to type into the chat box now. Shout out. Or Dina, anyone, anyone who's uh, one of the hosts can maybe just, if there's anything getting um, typed in. Not yet. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think it will not surprise people that a hate crime is a criminal offense, i.e. a crime against a person or property. And it's motivated in whole or in part by an offender's bias due to a victim's race, color, religion, disability, sexual orientation, national origin, gender, or gender identity. Uh, and this kind of um, grouping of identities is really based off the federal legal framework. I know later we're going to be talking a little bit more about the New Hampshire law. Um, but each state does have, or almost every state has its own kind of hate crime law. Um, there's a few exceptions to that. And some of the states vary in terms of which uh, categories are protected. So for instance, Kiara and I are based in the DC area. DC includes political affiliation as a protected category. And that's kind of um, one of the unique things about DC being the you know, political capital of the country. Uh, other states um, like New Mexico, for instance, include homelessness as a category. Um, so it does vary. Some states have a lot like California, other states have um, fewer categories. Uh, the perpetrator's prejudicial motive or bias is really what distinguishes a hate crime from other sorts of crimes. So, for instance, if I go up to someone and punch them um, in the face because I don't like their shoes or, you know, have, have some personal um, beef with them, um, that is a crime, but it might not be a hate crime. But if I punch them in the face because I don't like them because of their um, sexual orientation or race or gender or one of these categories, uh, and I'm motivated by that hate, then it's a hate crime. I always like to emphasize that hate crimes are also very different from other sorts of crimes in that they are messaging crimes. Uh, they send a message to other members of the group that has been targeted that that you know entire group is not wanted, uh, is not welcome in that community. So for instance, say in a post-COVID world where we're going back to our office and I go in on the first day and there's graffiti on the office door that says, I hate female attorneys. Um, that sends a message to me as the direct target uh, that I as a female attorney, am not welcome in the office, but it also sends a message to every other female attorney that I work with that they're not welcome there. And so message, uh, hate crimes really uh, reverberate across every one who shares that identity, um, which is part of why they're just so dangerous. So now what is a hate incident? Uh, it's an incident which is really just up to the perception of the victim. So if you perceive it as being motivated by prejudice or hate, we would consider it a hate incident. Uh, and it may or may not constitute a criminal offense. 
So for example, if you, you may be a victim of hate speech, which depending on the circumstances may not constitute a crime, but it could constitute a hate incident. And you can see my very simple diagram um, just showing that all hate crimes are considered hate incidents, but not all hate incidents are hate crimes. Okay, and now I'm going to really, uh, you can kind of go back to the chat box and Dina and Kira, I'll ask you to monitor, but just wanted to kind of get folks to engage in terms of whether they think something would be a hate crime or hate incident. So first of all, say there's a pickup truck, it drives past a group of black teenagers, the driver rolls down his window and shouts a racial slur out the window. Is that a hate crime? Anyone want to type in an answer? Are we getting anything? We have some. We have um, one person. <laughs> like you're getting, getting. Uh... We got three. We got three hate incident. Well, we got a mix. We got both hate incidents and and yes, it is a crime. Okay. So here, so again, this is kind of the funny thing about the law, and not to be too nerdy and take us all back to law school um, for the lawyers on the phone, but there there can be a great area. But in this case there's no real underlying crime per se. So it's probably just on the basis of these facts, I would say it's more in line with just a hate incident. Um, there's First Amendment rights um, at issue uh, and he, there, there's not necessarily a crime going on here. But let's change the fact pattern just a little bit. So say it's again, a pickup truck, he drives past a group of black teenagers, the driver again rolls down his window, shouts a racial slur. And then on top of that, he stops, jumps out of his car, grabs a BLM sign one of the teenagers is holding, jumps back in his car and drives off with the sign. Um, is that a hate crime or hate incident? So just take a minute to think about it and then um, you know, share your answers in the chat. People are saying crime. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah so, um, so does that, like, if, if this was in person, I would ask folks to shout out what's the underlying crime. One of them might just be, you know, he's stolen a sign. Um, and we actually have a, a case kind of about a stolen BLM sign right now um, that my group is litigating that we'll talk about at the end. Um, but yeah, so this seems, again, there could be other facts, uh, you know, that come out in the course of a full investigation. But on the face of this, this seems like um, he's motivated by bias in the sense that he shouted a racial slur uh, and he grabbed a BLM sign, which one would argue kind of has to do with a racial, ju racial justice angle and probably um, stealing that might be evidence of, uh, again, racial animus. Um, I'm a little short on time, so I'm going to skip the following one, but it would just be if, a, you know, the driver drove into the crowd itself, um, probably a crime, probably motivated by bias. So um, on the face of it, possibly a hate crime. Uh, so, as folks may or may not know, um, there's both the state laws and the federal laws. And within those two big buckets, there's also criminal laws brought by um, government attorneys, some of whom we have on the line and we'll hear from later. And then we have federal civil laws, uh, which can be used by private individuals or private organizations like where Kira and I work. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit more about some of the federal laws, and I know later we'll hear a little bit about the state laws from some of the other speakers. Just quickly, uh, this is just some of the federal laws that um, prosecutors and others might use. And the first one here, the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, I'll spend a few more minutes on. Uh, so... Quick question, does anyone know who either of these individuals are? I don't. Um, hearing that. Their names like earlier, just, just, just as a hint. Um, yeah. Matthew Shepard, yeah. So um, the young um, man on my left uh, is Matthew Shepard. He was a young... Um, uh, Wyoming, uh, college student in Wyoming. Um, he spoke, I think, three languages. Uh, he was gay uh, one night in college at the end of the semester when um, his dad says he should have been studying for finals. He went out to a bar, got a drink, met two guys who ended up abducting him, driving him out. 
um, to a pretty lonesome road um, and bludgeoning him to death and tying him to a fence. Um, and folks may remember this, this was in 1998. Um, James Byrd Jr. is the black man um, who's pictured here. Also in 1998, he was abducted by white three white supremacists, um, driven out on a lonely country road in Jasper, Texas, um, and dragged to death behind a car. Uh, really gruesome set of facts. Um, and this happened in 1998, which to be honest, is not that long ago. Um, it sounds like it should be something out of the Jim Crow era. It's not. Um, we work closely with the Bird family and um, our center is named in his honor. And um, the pain is still very real for both these families. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, we talk about hate crimes reverberating across communities. It's also intergenerational. And so you kind of see the trauma continue through generations. Uh, so in uh, President Obama, however, signed into law, uh, the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which is named in honor of these two men. Um, both killed in 1998 in these very high profile horrific hate crimes. There's two sections of the Hate Crimes Act. So the first section basically states that a person commits a hate crime if he or she willfully causes bodily injury or attempts to cause bodily injury using a dangerous weapon because of his or her bias towards an individual's perceived or actual race, color, religion, or national origin. Um, so folks might like at first just note that that's a fairly limited group of categories that's protected there. It's just those four. Um, but then there's a second section of the act, which says that the uh, act protects people who have, one, been victims of a crime, two, based on their actual or perceived religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability, if that crime affects interstate commerce, um, which is a little bit broader. And folks might pause there and wonder why this like weird, like it all makes sense until you get to that interstate commerce piece. Um, I would ask if we were in person, if anyone wanted to take a guess as to why that interstate commerce piece is there. So maybe, yeah, if anyone wants to type into the chat box, any guesses? If you don't. Federal jurisdiction um, to make to ensure states have consistency yeah, so actually these are kind of getting at it. Um, basically, <clears throat> the previous hate crime laws and um, the first piece of this hate crime law uh, was passed under the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, which of course abolished slavery and kind of gets at issues of race. But it doesn't protect issues getting at sexual orientation or some of these other categories. And so basically Congress um, thought to pass it under the Commerce Clause. Uh, and so basically, um, this kind of adds an extra layer to these cases, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I think Seth might also be talking about some of some of this later. Um, but I also just wanted to flag that the law is meant to act as a backstop to state laws. So the federal government only steps in for certain situations where it's necessary to ensure substantial justice. So again, you kind of have different layers here with the state and the federal government. And then um, Kira and I will also talk about some civil um, pieces at the end. Uh, okay, so more quizzes. Uh, let's say that just before midnight, Roger and Richard, who are a gay couple, leave a bar in downtown big city. They walk down Main Street, they're holding hands, they encounter a group of five young men. And uh, as they pass Richard and Roger, one of the young men uses a slur um, concerning their sexual orientation and says they're a disgrace to our Christian nation. And the two men are disturbed, but they get in their car and they go home without further incidents. Do we think, again, just on the basis of what we have here, is that a hate crime or a hate incident? Um, and what are kind of the, your thoughts on that? Incident, one response, incident, two responses. Okay, the first three are incident. Great. Yeah, so um, yeah, on the face of this, again, not really a crime necessarily. Um, so yeah, most likely a hate incident at this point. But again, let's change the facts slightly. So say they are black and gay, they're walking down the street wearing dump Trump t-shirts. They encounter a group of young men, the men yell, make America great, 
before charging Roger and Richard with baseball bats, knocking to them ground, causing physical injuries that require hospitalization. So is that a hate crime? Crime. One response. One person, so we have one of each incident and crime. One person says it's a crime in DC, but incident in other states. Assault, crime, so we had a mix. Yeah. Um, so here, the bias motivation seems to be not actually based off their race or gender identity. There's no evidence of that. They didn't shout um, a racial slur or um, an anti-LGBTQ slur. They shouted, make America great, which one would assume is kind of a political slogan. Um, so as someone said in DC where political affiliation is a protected category, there might be more here in terms of a hate crime, but um, just kind of on the basis of the Matthew Shepard, James Byrd um, Jr. Act, probably not a hate crime. Um, but say they did use a racial slur or a, um, a anti-LGBTQ slur then you might be getting more into it, uh, in, into, into the realm where you might be able to be prosecuted as a hate crime. Um, and let's say they used an anti-gay slur uh, and then the set of facts was the same. Um, as you might remember, and I'll just click back quickly, we still have to get past the third prong here, um, showing that it affects interstate commerce. So does anyone have any ideas how, how one might be able to do that in this fact pattern? No responses just yet. Yeah, and, and it, it's kind of surprising um, how people get around this. So for <laughs> instance, one of the very first prosecutions under the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was out, I think it was in New Mexico, and it involved a young Navajo man who had a mental disability. And um, he was tricked by some supposed white friends who tricked him into coming to one of their apartments where um, they um, ended up assaulting him pretty brutally. Um, one of the things they did, and apologies, because a little trigger warning, um, they heated a clothes hanger and branded the back of his head with a swastika, um, pretty gruesome. Um, but the prosecutors in the case uh, were able to bring this under the James Byrd and Matthew Shepard Act, um, including that piece where it protected disability, um, because they argued that the interstate commerce prong was satisfied because the clothes hanger was not made in New Mexico or Arizona. It had crossed state, uh, state lines. Um, and so again, for instance, in this fact pattern with the baseball bat, you know, maybe the baseball bat wasn't made in whatever state this occurred in. Um, and so you can kind of think about the interstate commerce piece, um, really thinking about it in a very broad uh, way. And Kira, do you wanna just talk a little bit about the hate crimes data? Yeah, yeah, so thank you, Arisha. So I know we're kind of pressed with time. We're trying to condense a lot of information into a little bit of time. So I'll try to go as fast as I can in a way that you can still understand what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, so slide 16, it just talks about um, the 2019 federal hate crime data and the importance of it. So um, federal hate crimes data shows that there was a slight increase in the number of hate crimes reported by law enforcement from 7,120 in 2018 to 7,414 in 2019. And this number is likely vastly underreported as, as over 85% of law enforcement agencies reported that no hate crimes occurred in their jurisdiction. Um, the targeted person's perceived race, ethnicity, or interest, ancestry is the largest motivating bias factor with almost half of those hate crimes being motivated by anti-Black or African-American bias. So um, black, black people and African-American African -American people in this country have long been the group that has been mo most targeted for bias, um, bias um, incidents of crimes. Um, uh, the data also shows a significant increase in the number of people who lost their lives as a result of a hate crime, jumping, from, jumping to 51% in 2019 from only 24% in 2018. In 2019 was unfortunately when um, a lot of those mass shootings occurred. So like El Paso, the El Paso shooting, um, the shootings that occurred at synagogues and things like that. A lot of people unfortunately lost their lives in those mass shootings. Um, 
King of four ever since. Yeah, and just to jump in quickly, uh, it's just the number went from 24 to 51, not 24% to 51%, just to clarify. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so next slide, the importance of accurate hate crimes data. Um, data drives policy, and so accurate hate crimes data could lead to better, more targeted resources and services for minority communities, and it can also build community trust among law enforcement and the communities that they serve because it sends a message to communities targeted by hate that they're a priority. So one of the things that Arusha said earlier was that hate crimes are usually messaging crimes. And so um, one thing that law enforcement and data, just hate crimes data in general can do, um, uh, th they can strengthen, they can send a message to the entire community that we're a priority, that your life matters and everything, every, your, your contribution to, the, to, to your community matter. Um, researchers and, law, and lawmakers rely on hate crimes data and trends to identify gaps in resources and ways to improve public safety in the criminal justice system through policy or law changes and amendments. That's it. Dina, I'll turn it back to you. Well, we had a, a timely question. How can we make reporting more accurate? Arisha, do you want to... Um, yeah, do we, are we taking questions now or are we going to save them for the end? Uh, this one seemed to fit in. <laughs> is, is there maybe briefly and then we're on to Sean Locke. Yeah, so I think um, one thing that we do a lot of work on um, with the Bird Center is training law enforcement departments on how to um, report the data uh, and also kind of knowing what to report. Um, so we um, have kind of helped, helped on that piece. Um, but police departments can only like report into the FBI what they know about. And so I think one of the main things is also building trust, um, having law enforcement departments build trust with the communities they serve so that community members know to report something um, or comfortable support, uh, reporting something. We talk a lot about communities that have um, maybe don't have the best relationship with police. So folks who are undocumented, who aren't comfortable or folks who um, might I mean, The immigrant be, community historically doesn't have good, good um, relationships. Exactly. Um, so I think building the relationships is key to improving reporting. I, I think some of our other speakers are also going to talk about the importance of reporting. And next we're going to hear from Sean Locke, the director of the State AG Civil Rights Unit. Sean. Everybody, thank you all for having me. I'm gonna to try to share my screen here and hopefully this will get my presentation up and going for you. So you should all be seeing kind of a PowerPoint presentation titled Hate Crimes and Civil Rights Act Violations in New Hampshire. Um, and before I get started, just kind of give you a brief overview of kind of who I am. So as Dina said, I'm the director of the Civil Rights Unit here at the New Hampshire Department of Justice, a position I've held for about a year and a half. Prior to that, I spent about five years as a prosecutor here in the Department of Justice. So I have some familiarity both on the criminal and civil side because I began my career as a disability rights attorney in Boston. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two sets of statutes here in New Hampshire. The first is the New Hampshire hate crime statute. And then I'll also talk about the Civil Rights Act in New Hampshire. Um, so the hate crime statute here, you can kind of see the text of what it covers. It's different from the federal hate crime statute in the sense that the hate crime statute in New Hampshire isn't a separate crime in and of itself. It is an enhancement, a sentencing enhancement that can be applied to any criminal act in the state. So. What happens is a crime has occurred such as an assault or uh, vandalism or something along those lines and then if it is motivated by hate which is specifically kind of the different categories are specifically defined so religion race creed sexual orientation national origin sex or gender identity um, then this hate crime statute can be charged and applied which enhances and extends the criminal the the potential criminal penalties for um, the underlying criminal act. And so kind of a not necessarily an exhaustive list here of different criminal acts it could apply to, but criminal threatening, uh, criminal mischief, which is also usually 
kind of more often known as vandalism, disorderly conduct, arson, interference with a cemetery or burial ground. Um, it doesn't cover kind of everything that might involve law enforcement in a way. So uh, violation level offenses, you know, the most classic example, which be hard to imagine how it could be hate motivated, but something like a speeding ticket or a DWI or something like that may not um, generally aren't going to be covered because they're too they're a violation level offense. It's also because it's a sentencing enhancement, it doesn't necessarily apply in proceedings involving juveniles. So juveniles aren't sentenced in the way that adults are, um, and they're not charged with crimes in the sense that adults are. They're charged to their delinquency petitions, and the sentencing is or the the end result is usually something that involves providing services to the juvenile to address needs to help them move past whatever kind of, whether it's behavioral or, or educational issues are causing them to engage in uh, criminal acts. So delinquency petitions wouldn't have necessarily an extended period of imprisonment as a result. Uh, but yeah. the proving a hate crime is kind of a two-part part, is a two-part process. First, the prosecutor is going to have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, all the elements of the underlying criminal offense. So kind of in an assault where someone pushes someone else, they'd have to be able to prove that the, basically the push occurred. And then second, they're gonna to have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the criminal offense was motivated by animus towards the victim's actual or perceived status as a member of a protected class. And what's important here, you know, essentially that's proving the hate motivation. Um, and it's a, a hate crime is a little different than a lot of criminal acts because in a cr general crim crime, so just thinking of the assault itself, a prosecutor doesn't have to prove motive for a crime. A prosecutor just has to prove that the act occurred and that the, the person who committed the act intended, met the kind of certain, me whatever mental state they had to have to commit a crime. But a hate crime requires proof of the hate motivation as well. Um, and so when I describe actual or perceived status or membership in a protected class, this gets into some of what Arush had mentioned. The focus here on a hate crime is the perpetrator's mental state and their motivation. It doesn't matter if the perpetrator is right or wrong when they attack someone because of their animus towards them being black or Jewish or gay. What matters is that they intended to attack this person because they hate them, because they believe that person was gay or black or Jewish and wanted to send a message or, or commit the crime against that person in that, for that reason. So for example, a person could be charged with shouting anti-Semitic slurs at and then attacking a person leaving a synagogue, regardless of whether that person was Jewish or not. The key though would be proving that the perpetrator thought their actions um, through their actions intended to, or believed that person was Jewish and intended to kind of attack them because of their Jewish faith. Um, and so the challenge here in a lot of these cases is gonna be proving animus, the, the hate motivation. Um, some examples like the one I gave where a person is shouting anti-Semitic slurs or racial slurs or homophobic slurs, those can be fairly clear cut because you have that hate language that's cropped into the, cropped into the incident and it makes things a little more clear about why, that, why the perpetrator did what they did. But sometimes the motivations can be more murky. Um, so for example, that hypothetical I just gave if the person hadn't shouted anti-Semitic slurs, but had just attacked someone leaving a synagogue, it's a little less clear what the motivation was there. It could just be they, you know, they were walking down the street and this was just a crime of opportunity. They saw this was the first person they saw and that's why they did that. But um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a complete lack of animus. And so one of the areas that we work in terms of kind of helping to better identify or my office works on and helping better identify hate crimes is kind of training for law enforcement to encourage them to kind of look beyond just kind of the basic facts. If there's kind of a hint that there may be animus to dig in and see if there's maybe more to the story than meets the eye kind of in the initial reports. Um, so that's kind of, that's a hate crime or just in a nutshell in New Hampshire. The second statute here I wanna talk about is the New Hampshire Civil Rights Act, which You'll read it here and it reads a little more similarly to the federal hate crime law. And so this isn't a criminal statute. This is a civil enforcement statute. And it's a me method for the attorney general's office, the office I work for, to uh, target and prevent bias or hate motivated actual or threatened uses of force, 
which is what I'll use to kind of speak generally about what's defined here as physical force, violence against, or property damage, or criminal tra or trespass on property. Um, and this statute protects members or protects, um, prevents or prohibits conduct motivated by animus towards race, color, religion, national origin, ancestry, sexual orientation, sex, gender identity, or disability. There are a couple of differences. So one big example that's different between the hate crime statute and the Civil Rights Act is the hate crime statute in New Hampshire doesn't cover disability, whereas the Civil Rights Act does. Um, and this was a law enacted in 1999 uh, in the, and is modeled on Maine's Civil Rights Act. So proving a Civil Rights Act violation occurred requires kind of three things to, requires three things to be demonstrated. First, that there was either an actual or threatened use of force, trespass or property damage. Proof that the actual or threatened use of force, trespass or property damage you know, prevented, intended to prevent, or intended to terrorize and coerce the target from engaging in otherwise lawful activity, and proof that the actual or threatened use of force was motivated by animus towards one of those protected classes. Um, one thing, again, that's a little different in the Civil Rights Act compared to the hate crime law, the hate crime law requires proof that the perpetrator was motivated by animus towards the victim's actual or perceived membership in a protected class whereas the Civil Rights Act doesn't necessarily require that. It just requires a general animus towards a protected class. So for example, like painting a swastika on the state house could be an example of a Civil Rights Act violation that may not be a hate crime because the state doesn't necessarily have a religious affiliation. Um, and so, and kind of thinking about the second prong in this or the second thing that would have to be proven um, kind of in terms of interference, this is a fairly low threshold doesn't have to be kind of an attack on a sacrosanct, sacrosanct right, such as the right to vote. It could be an effort to interfere with your ability to walk peacefully down the street, enjoy a public park. The one condition is here is that it doesn't cover unlawful activity. So if you had, you know, for example, broken into someone's home and then are threatened and racial slurs are shouted while you're being threatened, that's not going to be a Civil Rights Act violation because it's not protected. You're not engaging in a lawful activity. Um, Again, the hate motivation is usually gonna be the tricky part in a lot of these cases. And that's just because it, it gets into a mental state and gets into the, the perpetrator's mind. And so sometimes if there isn't, you know, if there aren't slurs being um, shouted or other identifiers that would kind of suggest a hate motivation, they can get a little more difficult to prove. Um, one thing to note kind of with a civil rights act would be think about Oftentimes where a civil rights act violation has occurred, there usually is a crime that has also occurred as well. So threatening to hurt someone is criminal threatening. There's generally gonna be criminal threatening. Damaging property is a crime in terms of criminal mischief and committing vandalism. Um, trespass on someone's property, you know, it could be something like a theft um, or criminal trespass. So there's usually a crime that's occurred as well. And Oftentimes, you know, we learn of Civil Rights Act violations and hate crimes through calls to law enforcement. Um, and I'll give kind of a historic example here to think about how um, the, the animus doesn't necessarily have to be motivated toward by, or the, the Civil Rights Act violation doesn't have to be animated by motive, animus towards the victim's race or, or membership in a protected class. If you think of the 1960s and the civil rights movement with kind of white freedom riders who were targets of race motivated violence because it was designed to discourage them from engaging the lawful, act the lawful activity of registering black voters. Um, and so the harms they suffered if the statute had existed then would have been covered by this law. So enforcing the Civil Rights Act, just kind of a quick overview. The Attorney General's office is the only office that can bring a civil rights enforcement action. That's part of how we're trying to kind of centralize the reporting of these incidents. Um, but we work very closely with local law enforcement agencies who are often the main point of contact in these matters. And we've issued even protocols to help with gathering data, assist with kind of improve the investigation of hate motivated acts and um, kind of centralize kind of that, that gathering of the data to make sure that we're seeing everything that's being reported and we can kind of see and get a sense of what's going on with respect to hate motivated acts in the state. Um, these actions can be brought against both adults and juveniles. So sometimes the Civil Rights Act can be a great way to augment a juvenile delinquency proceeding by imposing kind of a restraining order that lasts a lot longer 
than any sort of consequence that may come out of the delinquency proceeding. They move quickly because they have to be prioritized by the courts. So the courts, these won't languish in court for years and years. And they also have a slightly lower burden of proof than criminal cases. So they're a little easier to prove. And that's in large part because the penalty isn't quite the same as a criminal case. Um, so the remedies here is generally gonna be a restraining order, which prevents, and I have a couple of examples I'll talk about at the end, but it prevents the perpetrator from having contact with the victims, going to particular locations or preventing future civil rights act violations. If there's property damage or injury that results, it can get restitution, which is kind of repayment to the victims of the cost of that recovery. And it can also, there can also be a civil fine that's attached um, to, the, to the relief as well. And then as long as the restraining order is in effect, any violation is a crime. And that crime, depending on what the violation is, could be subject to a hate crime enhancement. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about freedom of speech and hate speech because that's often that comes up and even in that distinction between hate incident and hate crime, um, both the New Hampshire and the United States constitutions have protections for freedom of speech and these can limit the ability to charge certain crimes or civil rights act violations. Generally where speech gets involved, there might need to, there's generally gonna be, need to be a direct threat of violence or an incitement to commit a violent act. And, but it's, that's a fact intensive circumstance. And so it's still, even where you think you may be a victim and if you think, oh, it's, it's hate speech, it's terrible, it shouldn't happen. It's unwelcome and it's still, and I recognize it still causes people to feel unwelcome and unsafe in their communities. Reporting it to law enforcement still has value because it could show that, because one, that fact intensive nature, there may be a crime that occurred that may not be completely apparent just based on either your prior experience or your, your sense of kind of what constitutes hate speech versus a hate crime. Even if the act isn't prosecutable, it could be, it's important for law enforcement's intelligence gathering an individual points posting anti-Semitic flyers in town may later get arrested for assaulting a Jewish individual. And that knowledge of those, that anti-Semitic flyering could be the link that shows the assault was hate motivated. And applying kind of thinking about reporting hate motiva motivated acts in general, law enforcement may take steps to provide protection that the public doesn't always see. So if there's vandalism that's complaints they're receiving, there may be increased patrols to dissuade future vandals or catch vandals. Uh, or the police may intervene to discourage a person who's, be, who's been engaging in kind of hate speech harassment of other individuals. So there can be value sometimes even where an arrest and the prosecution doesn't occur, there may be efforts to protect the public that way. And then there also may be steps that you can take that will allow hate motivated conduct to become actionable. You could get a stalking order or a no trespass order and talking to law enforcement, they may be able to point you in that direction. And then once you take those steps, the next time a person harasses you or, or trespasses on your property, it does become a crime that can afford you kind of um, more protection. So I always kind of say, even though it's cliche, if you see something, say something. I'd rather investigate a complaint and learn I can't take action than not learn about it until something more serious happens. And that's true of all the law enforcement agencies I work with in New Hampshire. Um, one thing before kind of going too far, I did just want to touch really quick, quickly on my office also has the ability to bring education discrimination complaints because oftentimes bullying, hate motivated acts can relate to bullying in public schools. And this was power recently granted to us in 2019. And so, you know, harassment or discrimination by public education institutions because of a person's age, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, color, marital status, familial status, disability, religion are all covered. And so, you may have a child or, or learn of a child who's being bullied because they're, they're black, Jewish, gay, um, transgender in school and the school district's not taking action to protect that individual. That's something you know, I would like to hear about because there may be steps we can take to bring a discrimination claim against the school district and provide protection for that, for that student. Uh, and then just giving a couple of examples of recent cases our office has handled. The first, and the, they're titled this way because it's the name of the attorney general and then the defendant's name. So McDonald versus Proto Sawicki was uh, involved a Muslim family who was visiting an inn in Northern New Hampshire. Um, see that typo now. And they were assaulted by the innkeeper when they asked for a refund. And the innkeeper was shouting anti-Muslim and anti-Islamic slurs at them and making kind of really horrific statements to the family. And so they were, that innkeeper was prosecuted under the Civil Rights Act as well as criminally. And we were able to um, enter, get a judgment against the individual for that. Uh, that include a fine as well as a restraining order. 
The second is McDonald versus Bernier, um, where a transgender woman was exercising at a local gym and another person at the gym threatened to kill her several times for using the women's locker room. Again, um, there were fines issued as well as a restraining order against the individual. And this one even went far enough to prohibit that person from returning to that gym so they wouldn't encounter the victim in that case in the future. Um, and that is kind of the general overview here and some of my contact info, which I'll make sure can get shared after the fact as well. But um, as I said, if you see something, say something, please don't ever hesitate, whether it's contacting me, my office, or your local law enforcement agency, if you think you're the victim of a hate motivated act. Sean. Sean, thank you so much. Those are great cases. Uh, before we move on to uh, Seth A-Frame of the U.S. Attorney's Office, I just have a quick question. A juvenile in New Hampshire is, uh, what is the cutoff for a juvenile? Somebody asked that question. Is it a, 17? A juvenile is, I believe, 18 still, but they could be certified as an adult, I think, at any point, um, depending on the nature of the offense and, and kind of the issues involved. But I think it, the cutoff now is 18. It used to be 17. Okay. All right, um, thank you. So now we will hear from Seth A. Frame of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Thank you, Dina. So I am here in my official capacity and I'm going to talk as an, as an assistant U.S. Attorney in a minute, but I do wanna start by talking about a couple other areas of my life. Um, I am, as Dina said, I, I teach First Amendment law at the law school here in, in Concord. And I'm also a former Temple president. And I want to talk about that for a minute because in my life, those things in this particular area have come into conflict in how I think about certain things. So this area of the law is complicated because interests of the highest order are sort of in some ways in conflict. Um, in the uh, First Amendment area, we value free speech. We value it amongst the highest values of, that we have and the thing that we're proud of, proudest of as Americans. On the other hand, we value equality and we value that highly as Americans. And those things sometimes in this area can make, can create some tension. And let me try to put some you know, specifics on that. So in my law school class, I proudly teach of what happened in Skokie, Illinois in 1977. The neo-Nazis wanted to march in Skokie, Illinois, a heavily Jewish community. The community um, went to court they got an injunction to stop the march. And that went to the Supreme Court and then back to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Illinois. And ultimately the neo-Nazis were allowed to march. The uh, Jewish community had a counter protest. It was all peaceful. And ultimately the counter protest was much more effective than the neo-Nazi protest. And it was an example of how speech can counteract speech. And I teach that in my First Amendment class to talk about tolerance and how that's an important First Amendment value. And some argue one of the reasons we have a First Amendment, which is we have to tolerate speech we don't like. And um, I teach that well, and it works very well in my classroom when I do it. But here's something that happened when I was Temple president. Um, so I was Temple president and past president right after um, Pittsburgh. Um, which, as we know, was a very difficult time for all of us um, in the Jewish community. And at Temple Beth Jacob in Concord, there was a white supremacist type blogger who selected our congregation and our rabbi as a target. And there was a substantial amount of terrible things that were written on this person's blog. And it put to the test what I teach in my First Amendment class, because I felt it. My congregation felt it. We felt unsafe. The rabbi felt unsafe. Um, and it created, um, you know, I wanted something to be done. And yet, for the reasons you're learning tonight, it really did fall into the hate incident category. And I knew that as a prosecutor and as a First Amendment, you know, teacher. But I didn't like it. I really didn't like it. I wanted something to be done. Um, so that tension exists and it exists in my own life. And so I wanted to start by just acknowledging that that's real. And the reason it's real is because we care about equality. We care about stopping anti-Semitism and racism and all those things. And we care about free speech. And so we have to figure out how to 
draw the line and figure out how to balance, make that balance. And that's really what we're talking about and why this is such a hard area. Um, so let me turn from that to talking about my job as, um, as uh, an assistant United States attorney and what work the Department of Justice um, does in this area. So um, you may have seen in the last few days, uh, Merrick Garland um, in his confirmation hearings to be the next attorney general talked about fighting white supremacy as one of the Depart what's going to be one of the department's primary goals. Christopher Ray, who is the head of the FBI, testified before Congress just the other day, and he talked about the same thing. So this this will certainly be a priority. And if you're seeing my screen now, it has been a priority of the department. So the way that we and who work in U.S. attorney's offices around the country get our marching orders from Washington, D.C., are through memos from the attorney general. And um, this is the memo that Attorney General Barr sent out after um, Pittsburgh. And it, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but the bottom line of it is recommitting the department um, to fighting the wave of anti Semitism that was sweeping the country. And you can sort of scan it as I go down. On the second page, I just want to point out so it has directives to what we out here. Are supposed to do and it says he directs us to reinvigorate or as the case may be form a relationship with the jewish community in your districts he's tell he's you know instructing people like me to meet with representatives of the jewish community to reassure them of the federal government's commitment to protect people against anti-semitism and that the, the federal government um takes this as the highest priority so it it has been a priority of the department um, and it um, and it will continue um, to be a priority of the Department of Justice. So you saw the crimes, and I'm not going to go over them in as um, significant detail. But there are several federal crimes that can be used to charge um, conduct in this area. So you heard about the Shepherd and the Bird Hate Crimes Act, um, and there are several others. So. There's a statute that makes it a crime to use or threaten to use force to interfere with housing. There's a separate statute that says, makes it a crime to deface or damage religious property or to damage religious property because of the people who or the people and their beliefs that, that go that go to that um, church or synagogue. Um, there's there's crimes that outlaw the use or threaten use of force um, to interfere with a person. Um, because of the, because they're participating in a federally protected activity because of their religion, which can include going to school, employment, jury service, um, and it's also illegal to conspire, which just means to agree with another person, to injure or intimidate a person because of their exercise of their constitutional right because of freedom of religion. And this is there are probably others. If I showed you the criminal code of the federal criminal code, it's thick. There's a lot of different laws, but these, these are the major ones. And what I wanna point out to you is there's a theme that runs through them, which is the use or threatened use of force or intimidation or violence. And that really is the line that separates the kind of thing that ends up getting prosecuted versus the kind of thing that ends up in the hate incident that we abhor, but we tend to, that we don't prosecute um, because we say, well, it's terrible, but it falls into that, you know, First Amendment um, area where we say, well, we have to tolerate this horrible speech. Um, and that, you know, I recognize as we see events happening in our world gets harder and harder. And I'll be perfectly honest, I'm, you know, as I think about teaching First Amendment this coming fall, I know there are going to be questions that have never been asked before because of things that we've seen happen in the last several months. So it's a definitely a, a confusing time in this area, but I try to think of it as speech that's mean and just mean is not really prosecutable. Speech that's mean and either ends up in violence or threaten violence, those are the kinds of cases that we can end up um, um, doing. So what I wanted to do with just my last couple minutes here is, um, just um, give you some examples of things that are going on in the Department of Justice just in 2020. So I limited my search 
of cases to 2020 in anti-Semitism only. There are other cases in different protected categories, but given this group, I thought I would just try to find what's going on prosecution-wise federally in the um, anti-Semitism um, area. And, you know, it wasn't hard to find several cases that I can just talk to you that I think make the point that I just tried to make. So um, the first case I'll tell you about is a, is a Connecticut case, and it's a anti-Semitic death threats case. And here's what happened. Um, it was right, it was during Hanukkah, and this um, person was left messages um, on his voicemail that said, uh, the sun's go about to go down. Um, it would be a shame if your house were used to light the menorah or turned into a gas chamber. Um, just before Easter, the, the victim received another um, message. You better be gone by Easter weekend. If not, I'm going to stick you in an oven or shoot you. So you can see where that crosses the line from just being mean to threatening of violence. And it was related to housing. They wanted this guy, this Jewish person, out of the area. So the he was charged in Connecticut with um, violating the, the fair housing statute that was on the list that I showed you and also making a threatening communication, which is another statute that actually doesn't require the race component, but you can't make violent threats. So that one was in Connecticut. This second one is in Massachusetts and it's um, pretty troubling. Um, this is in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. And ultimately the crime was a homemade bomb that was five gallon gasoline canister it was placed in the entrance of a Jewish um, sponsored assistant living center. It was in an area of Longmeadow that had several other Jewish buildings, a synagogue, some other Jewish housing. Um, and the device was discovered because law enforcement was monitoring white supremacist activity on the internet. And there was an organization that was calling for mass killings at the quote, Jew nursing home in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. And it identified April 3rd as Jew, as Jew Killing Day, which listed one of the events as, the, as this Jew nursery, at the, the quote Jew nursery home. Um, and that the next day is when the bomb was found at this, um, at this center in Longmeadow. So another very troubling um, case. Um, the, the third case I have here is from Maryland and um, this is a man who just made kept calling the synagogue employees and threatening to kill members of the congregation with guns and by burning down the synagogue. And as you saw, doing that is a, is a violation of federal law. Uh, the most interesting one is um, a case out of Colorado. And I had already um, prepared to talk about this. And I was watching Christopher Ray talk in the, uh, before the Senate the other day from the FBI. And he actually brought this case up too. So I guess the, the FBI, the FBI is proud of this one as well. Um, so a white supremacist, um, so step back. One of the ways the FBI is attempting to deal with this problem, right? We don't wanna wait for places to get blown up, that's for sure. We wanna try to interdict early if we can. And so FBI agents act as undercovers in white supremacist organizations. Um, and so in Colorado, a white supremacist told an FBI undercover um, agent after visiting a temple that he wanted to do something to tell the Jews in Pe Pueblo, Colorado, that they were not welcome here. And the man said he wanted to launch a racial holy war and told the undercover agent that he wanted to use a bomb to get the temple, quote, off the map. So the FBI undercover and the defendant, they made several trips to the temple. They planned the attack together. And at the end of it, the FBI agent in his undercover capacity gave the defendant fake bombs that the defendant was going to plan to take to the temple the next day and blow up the temple. And so they arrested him at that time before, you know, obviously he only had fake bombs because he was dealing with, unbeknownst to him, an FBI agent. So um, that was a very big success using the undercover technique to stop something terrible um, that was you know, this guy wanted to do before he did it. So there are terrible um, things happening all around the country. The, these, these aren't ones that have made the, you know, the top of the news, but um, the federal government is, is prosecuting all of these kinds of cases. And um, that really gets me to my final thing that I do wanna say, 
which is uh, reflects what other people have said. But it really is report, report, report. Um, I can't stress enough, you know, you don't need to make the decision, well, is this prosecutable or is this not? Um, that's my job. That's, you know, we, we decide that ultimately based on what the statutes are and what we can do. But if we don't know about it, one, we can't do anything. But even if we, even if in the particular case, we can't do anything, there are resources we can help bring to you. And I'll just use Temple Beth Jacob as an example. Um, we got in touch with the FBI. I mean, I, you know, F New Hampshire's lucky. We have an outstanding leader of the FBI who takes this stuff very, very seriously. And um, he has been in touch with our synagogue since this stuff happened. So he contacts our rabbi. They have, you know, formed a, formed a relationship. Um, he checks in um, if she needed anything, if she was concerned about anything she would be able to call him. Um, and so these resources are there. And when, if you have something that happens and you contact us, we can maybe prosecute it, but also really help you form relationships with law enforcement, FBI on the federal side that I think can um, give a sense of, you know, uh, you know uh, that, some, that there are people out there who are there to help you. And that's really, that's really what we want. And if we don't know about it, if I, if I, if then it's harder to do that. And so um, I try to blend here what I've done as a prosecutor, but also what I've done as a temple president. And I think that it was helpful to really get the rabbi connected to, to the FBI here in New Hampshire. I think it's been good for my temple and it's been good for, for her. So if, if you have reasons to contact me, um, you know, I can, you know, certainly help you make those connections. Thank you, Dina. Seth, thank you. And thank you for sharing your personal experience. The uh, last person, well, we're gonna hear next from Raphael Katz, the Affirmative Civil Enforcement Coordinator and Civil Rights Coordinator. And then we're circling back to Arusha and Kiera for a few minutes. So, um, Raphael, take it away. And uh, Seth, you have to stop sharing your screen. Yes. Hmm. Stop share. There we go. Thank you, Raphael. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, thank you, Seth. Um, like Seth. I am also an assistant United States attorney for the District of New Hampshire. And I wanna thank you all for being here, for talking about such an important topic. A, a quick disclaimer, um, any opinion I express today is uh, on behalf of myself, not the Department of Justice or United States Attorney's Office, and, I, and I'm not giving any legal advice. Uh, without that, with that out of the way, a little bit about myself. So I am the Affirmative Civil Enforcement Coordinator. And what that means is I work on affirmative civil enforcement matters, such as really two main areas. One is civil fraud, investigating, enforcing violations of civil laws, where, where companies or individuals fraudulently obtain money or otherwise defraud the government, for example, in government contracts, uh, government grants or Medicare and Medicaid fraud. The other main aspect of what I do as affirmative civil rights, uh, affirmative civil enforcement coordinator is as the civil rights uh, coordinator uh, involving affirmative civil rights enforcement. And <clears throat> we work in concert with the civil rights division of Department of Justice to investigate and enforce the civil rights laws uh, for example, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and their laws and requirements, uh, for example, for providing accessibility to persons with disabilities. Uh, my focus today, though, will be on the civil rights area and civil enforcement that best ties and overlaps with and hopefully prevents hate crimes. And, and that's in the educational arena. Um, 
our office, along with the Department of Justice through the Civil Rights Division's Educational Opportunity Section, enforces federal civil rights laws that prohibit discrimination in schools so that students have equal educational opportunities without regard to race, color, national origin, sex, religion, or disability. Generally, um, these laws are looking to the schools for responsibility to take immediate and appropriate action in response or to prevent discrimination, harassment of their students. Um, schools are often the places where seeds of hate can be planted and can grow. So enforcing these laws may overlap with hate crimes and may be important in preventing future hate crimes from occurring. The Education Opportunity Section, uh, along with our office, is responsible for enforcing Title IV of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which gives the Attorney General authority to address certain complaints of discrimination against students based on race, color, national origin, sex, and religion in public schools and institutions of higher learning. A little bit about the, the te technical details, though I won't spend too much time on that. Um, Title IV enforcement authority is triggered by a signed written complaint from a public school student or a parent or guardian. Um, now the um, <clears throat> Private legal bar and, and nonprofit organizations are on the front lines and doing really important work to shed light on religious uh, discrimination and other discrimination in schools. Many of our cases come as referrals from these partners. One other um, set of laws worth mentioning is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and national origin by recipients of federal funds where the DOJ can also play a role. Uh, Title VI does not cover religion, um, but it, it does uh, cover, again, other uh, places where uh, Jewish discrimination can come up. Um, and it, do it does have a private right of action. Part of Justice also monitors uh, many federal lawsuits that involve these statutes and consider getting involved um, in a different way from just bringing it, uh, such as uh, sometimes filing statements of interests or other briefs or opinions uh, where there's an issue of great import importance to the Department of Justice. Now, focusing on harassment, what is harassment? Harassment's unwelcome conduct based on protected classifications such as race, color, national origin, sex, disability, or religion. It can include verbal abuse such as name calling, epithets, slurs, graphic or written statements, threats, physical assault, other conduct that may be physical, threatening, harmful, or humiliating. Now, um, mention a couple of technical differences in terms of the different laws here. Uh, important to note in terms of looking at harassment conduct, co conduct targeting a student based on religion might implicate other protected classes, including race and national origin. And uh, one other thing is don't get hung up on the bullying label. Sometimes schools do. There are often bullying policies in effect, but bullying might require a different type of circumstances, a power differential or repeat incidents. Um, but so a school limiting its response to just a bullying policy might be missing uh, from considering whether um, the student misconduct and their res is, results in discriminatory harassment that needs a response. I'd like to pull up a um, fact sheet from the Department of Justice based on the White House initiative in 2016 on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. It, it gives a um, <clears throat> some good fact details to see how the fact scenarios to, to see how these might arise. So looking at some of these scenarios that were put forward, um, I'm going to just go through a, a few of them, but they're up on your screen so you can see them. 
The fir first one, a Korean American student tells her principal that a group of Korean students has repeatedly stolen her Asian history textbook and she is not a real Korean because she only speaks English. The principal tells her that because the students who are bothering her are also Korean, it was probably a misunderstanding among friends and takes no action. So here, you know, you have that, the, con the student conduct, what they did in, in, in um, <clears throat> Uh, stealing the textbook and saying those things. And then you have the response of the school and are, is, is, is that response appropriate? Is that response uh, uh, um, what's necessary? Um, another, I'll skip to you, uh, down a few. Um, a student from China receives an out of school suspension for violating the school's code of conduct. Before meeting with the assistant principal to discuss the suspension, the student's parent requests an interpreter, but school administrators do not arrange for one. When the parent arrives for their meeting, there is no interpreter and the assistant principal proceeds with the meeting. And again, um, there, here you have a certain way where uh, the, the students are being discriminated against and the school is not um, responding. Um, final one I'll do in this in, on this fact sheet is uh, let's get to the last one. A group of Asian students is hit and taunted every week in gym class by other students who say Asians are supposed to be good at math, not basketball. When they complain to the teacher, they are told the, that the best response is to ignore the other students and to focus on doing better in gym class. Once again, the conduct by the students and the response by the teachers. Uh, this this. I can uh, make this available and it's otherwise publicly available for the other um, <clears throat> examples here. Um, I'd like to talk about some actual cases that happened. Um, in 2014, there was a resolution with the Calb County School District in Georgia involving their failure to effectively respond to prevent harassment in the religion or national origin context. There, a Sikh middle school student complained of repeated incidents of peer harassment on the basis of his religion and national origin. They called him Aladdin, a terrorist, because he wore a turban. They told him to go back to his country. The harassment culminated in a physical altercation. Uh, he alleged he was disciplined more severely um, than the white student that was involved. The Civil Rights Division opened an investigation and uh, revealing that uh, the district did not um, investigate the incident appropriately or respond appropriately. And um, as we discussed earlier, uh, schools must take immediate and appropriate action to investigate allegations of harassment and must take prompt and effective steps reasonably calculated to end that harassment and eliminate the hostile environment, prevent the harass uh, har harassment from occurring. And uh, Raphael. Yes. I'm sorry. Before you go on to the next example, we're really we're running out of time. The so the program ends at 7:30. We have to circle back to Arusha. I, let me just ask you. Um, it it is it fair to say that maybe w one incident, uh, one incident might rise to something that your office could prosecute, but might not. Whereas a pattern. Um, if there's a pattern of incidents of failure to respond by the school that um, might make a case better for civil prosecution. And so it's important that all of these incidents are reported so you can make an assessment whether the individual circumstance is sufficient or um, collect data to discover whether there's an unacceptable pattern. Yeah, I, I think that um, reporting, like everyone has said, is very important of every incident, whether it's enough or not, it's very important to get these on, on the record and, uh, and, and, to, and to report them. And there, again, there's organizations as well and private attorneys that can uh, work with this as well, but getting it to us is important. Um, I, I, in, in, because of the time constraints, I'll, I'll jump ahead real quickly to, um, a, la a last uh, example or two very quickly. One is um, 
in the private context, uh, a case called T versus Pine Bush Central School District, where um, a private case was bought, brought under uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Act by uh, five students that were Jewish and suffered anti-Semitic discrimination, harassment, and bullying. But the uh, alleged school never took any action, appropriate action, to protect protect them, despite numerous complaints. And uh, these involved all sorts of uh, anti-Semitic slurs that you can imagine, uh, anti-Semitic graffiti, drawing, drawing, engraving swastikas on books and notebooks, um, as well as uh, physical harm, uh, attempting to force pennies into another student's mouth, and anti-Semitic jokes about the Holocaust. The United States did get involved after the private suit by filing, filing a statement of interest in support uh, of not having the case dismissed. Um, ultim ultimately, and just kind of talking about resolutions here, which can be whether it's brought by the United States investigator or brought privately, uh, the school district paid $4.48 million uh, and is um, and had to overhaul its policies, procedures, training and education and reporting relating to bullying, discrimination and harassment. The district uh, had to institute mandatory training and education for students and all district employees to improve uh, tolerance and reduce anti-Semitic harassment and other bullying led by the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, so again, uh, this is a, a kind of situation where you're looking to the school for responding to things. And as you're gonna have an overlap sometimes with the with, where the, the acts by other students may um, amount uh, to uh, something that may be thought of as a crime, but the school has, a, has the uh, responsibility to respond appropriately and prevent the harassment from coming. And, and, and finally, before, before I end, just one last uh, piece is that, you know, there was a case uh, called, um, <clears throat> outside of the, of the student context, there was a case called Owen in the United States versus Lance Area Schools, where a, a Jewish public school teacher um, complained of discrimination and harassment by students where um, um, all sorts of swastikas and hate messages uh, were made by students during his class without any adequate response. And that ended up with also a settlement where the uh, <clears throat> school district had to um, <clears throat> had, had to take remedial uh, measures and change their policies and, and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Raphael. Sure. Well, I'm and sorry. I mean, all these stories, cases are interesting, but we're we're running out of time. We so let's um, move on. We're we're going to circle back to Arusha and Kiera. We're going to tell us a little bit about um, what other remedies might be available. So there's state criminal, state civil affirmative action, federal criminal, federal affirmative action, and what else, Arusha and Kiera? Yeah, we'll do this very quickly because I do know we're um, at time. Um, so uh, the I wanted to mention just two cases. One is a case we brought um, as a private civil rights organization against the Proud Boys at the start of January um, concerning activity by the Proud Boys targeting our client, which is a historic black church uh, in DC. Um, basically the Proud Boys vandalized the church. Um, I'll skip the legal um, framework, but just to kind of flag as one of the types of cases um, lawyers committee and other civil rights groups can bring um, on the civil side. Um, and then Kira, do you wanna just kind of mention very quickly uh, the facts on Dumpson? Yeah, so just very quickly, Taylor Dumpson, she is an African-American woman, um, actually a law student right now in New York, but um, in, in, this, in this instance, she was a student at American University. She was the first African-American woman elected as SGA president. Um, and the, the day after she was elected, well, the night that she was elected slash going into the next day, she was doxxed online. She was harassed. She was, there were nooses and banana peels hanging all over her, uh, all over American University's campus. And she's also a member of the AKA sorority. The, their plot on campus was completely trashed and nooses and, and banana peels thrown about. So clearly um, uh, some racial, racially motivated um, um, epithets and, and um, uh, actions. And um, this is an important case because it does get at online harassment, which is a growing problem. 
Um, and um, yeah, I will leave it there because I know we're shorter on time and so I'll turn it back to you, Dina. Well, well that, those cases are so interesting. I, and I actually saw that, that woman speaking at an ADL Never Is Now conference two years ago. What she won her, she, pre, she sued the, sued against the school, so, correct? So, no, so we sued um, Andrew Anglin, who um, okay. was a leading Nazi, as well as um, two of the trolls who we were able to identify who basically took his call um, to harass our client. Um, and uh, we were able to sue them. We were actually able to engage in a settlement agreement with one of the former white supremacists, which was very, like, it, it's pretty unique. Um, so as part of his settlement agreement, he agreed to sit down with our client, apologize in person, and also write out an apology. Uh, and we also asked him to really take seriously um, a commitment to educating himself about the history of racism and sexism in our country, because those were the kind of his motivations and targeting Taylor, um, and he's he's doing that. Um, so that was one kind of win for us. And then um, the other defendants, the court gave us a default judgment, um, and so um, we're still um, working to collect on the judgment. And we're actually um, there's a similar case um, where Andrew Anglin, the same defendant, targeted um, a woman based off her Jewish identity. Um, and so there's you know this is just kind of goes to like the online harassment that's so prevalent today. So I have, um, I, I've lost my screen. I have a memory that um, in the second lawsuit, the one with the woman from American University, was there a big uh, money judgment? Yeah, so we had a large judgment as did some of the other lawsuits against the same um, uh, defendant, Andrew Anglin. Um, so yeah, the, the judges have really recognized the in-person harm that online harassment can cause uh, in those judgments. That is amazing work, fabulous. Did, were there other examples? <laughs> Before we have just a few minutes to take questions, but are there, were there other cases you wanted to share that, um, no. No, I, I, I don't think so. I just wanted to kind of mention the AME case against the Proud Boys. Um, uh, because it targets it targeted like a religious institution, um, and then also the online harassment case. But um, happy to stick around for questions. And I don't, okay. I don't know if that's where you wanted to go next. Yeah, um, I don't see any additional questions in the chat, um, but I'm looking. There were um, so early early on. Someone asked whether we were aware of HB 544, which is a um, bill that will, well, uh, it, 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 it prohibits teaching that one race or ethnic group is superior to another, but it has a lot of other tidbits. Um, you it's know, a little- a uh, question. Yeah. We have, someone has a question. I think Vicky, Vicky Pittman has a question. Are we, are we taking questions live or are we going to have people edit into the chat box? We we're going to have it. So people understand. We're, we're going to have it go into the chat box. Okay. But, so um, on that, it's that talking about that statue is a little far afield. All I can say is if you, um, if you don't like it, write to your local representative. Um, and Kiara, what was the question that you had seen? I, she raised, she has her hand raised um, in the in the hand raising feature and I, I just, I saw it and I didn't want it. I wanted to make sure we got to her. Okay, I didn't see that. Whoever you are, can you write into the chat what your question is? Um, someone here has asked, what causes of action can be used to go after the assets of hate group organizations? Uh, Arusha, is that something you can answer? Yeah, so um, our lawsuit against the Proud Boys is kind of uh, modeled off some other lawsuits brought in the 80s um, and in previous years by the Southern Poverty Law Center against the KKK, where the goal was really um, to run up money damages and damages is just a fancy legal way of saying money um, to really bankrupt these groups. So um, that uh, part of our claims here is just for um, 
money um, as a way of kind of um, defunding some of these groups. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Are there, um, within the state system, Sean, are there, uh, you have any suggestions for going against the assets of hate groups? So, I mean, the answer here would be similar to kind of what Arush has described, which is looking for acts that, you know, you have to kind of link the acts to the larger hate group, you know, not just the specific individual to go after their assets for damages, but both at the state and federal level, a lot of the claims you could bring are similar. So you can use those systems kind of in the same way to target the assets of um, hate groups, um, uh, those who are victims and targets of those groups. So I have a question. Um, I think virtually all of you have asked, have said reporting is key um, to help communities, to, you know, prosecute, to all sorts of things. Of the people here who've spoken, individuals could report to uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, it could report to the state AG, could report to the U.S. Attorney's What's the bottom line? What what does an individual, who does an individual report to? Should he or she start with, if it's an obvious crime, start with the local police and then get some guidance as to who else to report to? Or what, how is, how is the average person supposed to figure out who he or she should report to, should report the incident to? So I'll I actually think there's no wrong answer because when it's reported, I mean, so local police is always a good place to start. So let me say that. But if you chose to call me, it is my job. I know how to, con if, if it's not something that's a federal matter, um, it's my job to connect you to the place that you need to go. And I think all the people who are talking, you know, we can't expect citizens to know exactly where to direct things. So when I get calls and it's really a state matter, I connect them to the state. Um, and so, you know, again, if, if you think it's a crime and, and your, your local police should be able to help you, but if you want to call the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, you know, I will help you either find the right place to go. So I don't want people to be stressed out. Oh, I got to figure out the right place to call. Calling someone in this sphere is really the key. Right. I, um, was, go ahead. I was gonna echo that, but I mean, the one thing to emphasize, obviously if you like, if there's a kind of a threat to your health or safety or kind of an active crime going on, I would recommend calling your local police just for that immediate relief they can provide. So they can provide intervention that, you know, our offices wouldn't be able to provide in, in that short interim period. But after that, if you're just reporting, you know, if you're kind of following up on the report or want one of our offices to look at, there's really no wrong place to go. And we can all, we all can and are able to talk to each other and refer things to each other as needed. So, you know, making a complaint to one agency or all the agencies, it will, you know, it will get where it needs to go. Mm. Um, I guess I would add though, that if aside from reporting to the police, and uh, maybe then getting directed to go to the state AG or the U.S. Attorney's Office. If if you are Jewish and you have a victim of a hate incident or a um, some hate incident, you sh it would be good to also report it to the ADL and the Jewish Federation of New Hampshire. And um, we're fortunate to have James McKim here tonight who is the president of the Manchester NAACP. And he asked that if, um, if for racist incidents to please report it to the NAACP. I think that's what he said in his comment. Um, a number of people have asked, more people have asked about HB 544. That's the bill um, that uh, deals with what can be taught in schools about racism and sexism, and uh, it's really beyond the scope of tonight's presentation. 
It hasn't been passed. It's just been introduced. It's about to be debated. Um, I would suggest that if you're opposed to it, that you write to your represent local representative. I'm just going to check the questions again. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I don't, um, I'm having a little bit of a problem with my chat function, <laughs> uh, but I think we're, we're, we're at time now. Um, I, I would like to just go over the reporting because I'm, I'm still a little confused about that. Um, is it fair to say if you, if it's a crime, like you have been hit, your child has been hit, um, report it to your local police, they're going to respond as quickly as possible it, and it they will know the, yes. what. It is always the right place to start. Right. You can never go wrong calling the police in your okay. community for help. never and then presumably the police might tell you this is a federal matter um how will it go from local police to like the fbi to the u.s attorney's office they very well would so if it's a serious you know event that that seems to fit one of those statutes i showed the fbi is in touch and there are requirements i mean there are requirements that local police report hate crimes um, to to the FBI, so that, that they should be doing that. Um, but I do get calls, so don't like you may say, "All right, my 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 local police treated it as an assault, and that's how it's being handled." Let's just assume. But I think it has a hate crime piece to it, and I also want to talk to the U.S. Attorney's Office. You can do that, um, and so you know you can you can self advocate as well if you think you want it you know you you want it to try to get more resources or or whatever um we we are here in that capacity so i would i would never say i would encourage you to always call your local police for the reason sean said for the reasons dina said and then but don't think uh, that well then i'm done if i if i want to you know pursue this further so you know, you i, I want to ask you can a hope that other law enforcement Go ahead. No, I was I just uh, why don't you finish what you were going to say? I wanted to ask Arusha and Kira, like, when would you contact the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights or the, you know, Matthew Shepard Foundation or James Barrett Center? When, when would you go that next step? Yeah, and apologies, my internet went out for a second, so hopefully you'll hang in here for the last minute. Um, I think, so I, I agree, you know, with other folks, if you are comfortable contact law enforcement, um, that's great. If, for instance, we've had people not comfortable contacting law enforcement for any number of a reason, reasons, um, law enforcement might be part of the problem. Um, you know, they, they've been targeted by law enforcement or there just might not be trust. Um, and so oftentimes what we will do help be a liaison in that situation. So um, we're a community nonprofit based organization. Um, and sometimes people are just more comfortable coming to a community group, um, calling our hotline, getting some help that way. And then we can connect them um, to law enforcement through through you know, our own connections. Yeah, I, I will add that, that um, sometimes if you, if you feel if you have been the victim of a hate incident or a hate a hate incident you think maybe it's a hate crime and you're not getting um, what you feel is appropriate relief from the police or the, a school if your child suffers something at school if you contact one of these nonprofit organizations like the anti-defamation league or the jewish federation or the beard center you may um, get the kind of assistance you feel you're not getting. And I got involved with um, anti-Semitism issues because um, as a 
temple president, people had come to me with their, with um, things that had happened to their students and um, they, feel, they felt the school wasn't appropriately responding. And, and I was able to um, give them the kind of attention that they couldn't get from like a busy school department. So um, contacting a private nonprofit in addition to the police might, might be really be useful to you. There's somebody who's, we're, we're out of time. There's somebody who's asking about the vandalism at their temple. I am gonna cut and paste this. And um, uh, if actually you can write into your chat, your email address, I will get back to you. So, um, and, uh, someone uh, wrote about vandalism at their church or synagogue um, to face a religious item. Please just, just write in your email address and I will get back to you um, tomorrow or next week. So we're out of time. I, I hope everybody has um, learned a little something <laughs> that they didn't know before. I'm very grateful to our speakers. And um, again, I want to invite you if you're interested in specifics on what's happening in New Hampshire, please register for the community conversation we're having on March 18th at six o'clock on white supremacy and extremism in New Hampshire. And you can find the link to that on, our, uh, on the Jewish Federation's event page or on the event um, on our Facebook page under events or on the Facebook page of the New Hampshire Council of Churches. That's March 18th. And um, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you very much to our panelists. I hope everyone has a great night and a great weekend. I think that's a wrap.